Alright boys, welcome to the second part of my tank ammunition guide. Like the last video, this one may only be talking about real life tank ammunition, but again, we'll be using War Thunder footage in the background to help demonstrate the effects of these rounds, as well as the tanks that fire them. In the last video we covered the kinetic energy shells, basically ammunition that uses its velocity and weight to penetrate a target. Today, we're going to be talking about chemical rounds. These rounds don't really rely on the kinetic energy to penetrate it. Instead, using the chemical energy stored inside the shell, mainly in the form of high explosive. It's the detonation of this chemical energy which gives these shells their destructive capabilities. This gives chemical shells quite a few advantages over kinetic energy shells. It doesn't really matter about the speed that these shells travel at, because as I've said, it's not the velocity that determines the penetrative capabilities of these type of rounds. This means you can have a very powerful chemical round fired from a fairly low velocity gun. This allows you to keep the ammunition and the gun rather light, allowing rather small light vehicles to have a very punchy gun. This is why at the end of World War II, we saw a transition away from long, high velocity guns to shorter, more moderately powerful weapons. One last thing about chemical rounds. The power of a chemical shell is pretty much directly linked to the diameter of a shell. Naturally, a 122mm high explosive round is going to be more powerful than a 76mm high explosive round. Because the former shell is just under twice as large as the latter, it can carry a lot more explosive filler, giving it a lot more destructive power. So while the general evolution for kinetic energy rounds was to get smaller and faster, with chemical rounds, they just tended to get larger. The guns of the early Cold War tended to be rather mediocre in terms of velocity, but it was a general trend in terms of an upwards in terms of diameter. For example, the Americans went from a 76mm gun to a 90mm to a 105mm. And the Russians went from 85 to 100 to 115 before settling on a 125. Now, there was a minor technical invention during the mid part of the Cold War, which was called composite armor, which pretty much nullified chemical rounds completely. That's why we went back to using the kinetic energy rounds, the APFSDS, but we covered that in the last video. But again, you're probably sick of me rambling about pointless shit that no one cares about. Let's jump straight into the first ammunition type. When we think of chemical rounds, we usually think of high explosive. And for the majority of the time that the shell existed, high explosive was really the only option. Shell guns became popular in the late 1850s as a weaponry for large sailing ships. They were designed to penetrate the thick wooden armour of the main warships of the time, and then detonate inside, where the powder charge and resulting shrapnel would, uh, incapacitate the crew, shall we say? While we're on the subject of 1850s technology and just how awful they were, there was also another shell called the Martin shell. This was essentially a hollow cannonball that was filled with liquid iron. Yes, liquid iron. Iron that has been heated to 1200 degrees Celsius, put into a cannonball and then fired into another ship. When the Martin shell hit another ship, all that molten iron would splash on all of the crew, basically cooking them alive. Nasty stuff as I'm sure you all agree. But again, I've got another tangent about the Royal Navy. Let's get back to tanks. As I said in my previous video, the tanks were basically an off branch of the Navy, and the high explosive shells of the early tanks came pretty much straight from the Navy as well. While in the Navy, high explosive rounds were basically used to destroy the superstructure, the non-armoured tertiary and secondary batteries, as well as most importantly, just start fires and cause general havoc. The navies of the time knew that high explosive rounds wouldn't be able to actually destroy an enemy ship, but they could incapacitate it and start fires. And that's pretty much what high explosive rounds on tanks were used for. You can't really use them against enemy tanks, but you can use it to destroy emplacements, fixed guns, fixed machine guns, enemy combatants. As nasty as blowing human beings to pieces is, it is surprisingly effective at winning wars. And pretty much the entire doctrine of the Red Army, or modern day Russian Army, is based on firing a shitload of high explosive in your enemy's direction. But generally, a high explosive round is usually a full calibre shell. This means they are big, and typically are much slower in terms of velocity, compared to its armour piercing companion. The round is obviously also hollow, this is where it contains a high explosive filler. This means it has no real penetrative capabilities. Depending on the fusing, a high explosive round can have a fuse on the nose of the projectile or on the base of the projectile. A nosed fused high explosive round will detonate upon impact, whereas a base fused round will detonate as a shockwave from the impact 
hits the rear fuse, setting off the shell. So it would basically act as a slightly delayed fuse. Based fused high explosive rounds are mainly found on air dropped bombs as well as naval guns. You don't really find them in tanks though. It's mainly nosed fused high explosive. Like all other shells, the high explosive round did have several evolutions. And first of all, this once again came from the Navy. After the First World War, there were slight inklings that the aircraft was going to become a menace to ships in the future. And a way to counter those pesky aircraft was starting to be produced. This was called the high explosive timed fuse shell. These rounds had a fuse in the base of the shell, which was triggered upon firing the round. As you might be able to guess from the name, the timed fuse had a timer, which would detonate the shell after a certain amount of time after firing. This meant if you knew the velocity of your shell, as well as the distance to an enemy plane, you could alter the fuse to get the round to detonate in the vicinity of the aircraft. A high explosive shell detonating near an aircraft would obviously not be the greatest day for the pilot, and considering in the 1920s the average speed of planes was still pretty low, so you realistically did have quite a lot of time to set up for a shot and actually get a hit. These high explosive time fuse shells weren't too common in tanks, but they were available for several anti-tank guns. For example, the 88mm gun that was fitted to the Tiger II had a time fuse round, but that obviously comes from the 8.8cm Flak 37. I don't think Hitler was having Tiger II's shoot down B-17s, but I guess he would if he could. I said that this round was first developed due to the idea that planes were going to become a menace in the world wars to come, and give that guy a cookie because he was right. The Americans found this out the hard way, with several Japanese planes slamming into the decks of their carriers. Kamikazes as well as dive bombers were a real threat, and the 20mm and 40mm guns that the Americans were using were very good at destroying planes, but those incoming planes usually had the chance to drop their ordnance before they were destroyed. What the Americans needed was a weapon that could destroy a plane before it entered its terminal dive. While the 5-inch 38 gun was pretty good, it was still using the high explosive time fused rounds. This issue led to the development of the high explosive variable time fuse, or HEVT. This used a very basic radar system fitted in the nose fuse of the round. When this variable time fuse detected metal, it would detonate the round. This meant you just had to fire the round in the general direction of the incoming plane. A good way to explain this would be a proximity fuse. These HEVT rounds are incredibly effective and served the Americans and then later the British very well. You could say that these 40mm HEVT rounds were pretty much the genesis for all modern air to air missiles, at least those fitted with a proximity fuse. One of the old rounds that didn't stand up to the test of time, unlike the HEVT, was the shrapnel shell. This was first created in the 1700s as a medium range defence against approaching infantry. However, it is probably most widely used in World War I, fired by the thousands of heavy guns which tore up an entire generation of European men. However, it was mainly the Soviets that were going to use it in their tanks. Like the high explosive round, a shrapnel shell has a thin wall of metal, which is then filled with high explosive powder, as well as metal fillings, usually iron or lead ball bearings. While for most of history, the shrapnel shell was anti-personnel, these Soviet shrapnel shells were designed when tank armour was incredibly thin. It was intended to penetrate the thin armour of a tank and then detonate inside, with the resulting shrapnel being sent round the crew, creating massive amounts of spalling. Because of the rapid increase in armour protection on tanks, the shrapnel shell quickly fell out of favour. Another slightly odd chemical round, which didn't fall out of favour, is the high explosive squash head, or HESH round. This was quite a late invention, being an early Cold War phenomenon. It was mainly used by the British, and still is to this day mainly used by British forces. Although, Pretty much every nation that used the L7 gun used some sort of Hess shell. Hess shells were mainly used as an anti-emplacement round, but they were found to be incredibly effective against lightly armoured targets as well, such as troop transports and light tanks. It gets the name Squash Head because the entire nose of the shell is comprised of some sort of plastic explosive. Because the nose of this round is soft, when it hits a target it will deform, squashing if you will. This means this round can impact at pretty much any angle, and it will squash onto the target, kind of like Play-Doh pushed into a crevice. When this plastic explosive detonates, it sends a shockwave through the armour, which will usually cause shrapnel to break off the other side. This means a Hess shell doesn't have to penetrate the armour of a tank to do damage. It is the shockwave being transferred through the armour, which causes this round to be so deadly. If you watched my previous video, I said that after World War II, main battle tanks became very weakly armoured, due to the presence of heat FS, 
around which we'll cover later. During this time when tanks were very lightly armoured, high explosive squash head rounds were an incredibly viable way for knocking them out. But in the mid 1980s, when composite armour was developed and tanks started getting much bigger, Hesh was no longer considered an anti-tank round and went back to being a purely anti-emplacement round. While Hesh certainly does have some very incredible characteristics, it does have some rather large downsides as well. Because the round's nose is soft by definition, it can't really be fired at a high velocity. This means it is a very large, heavy shell moving at low speed. This means if it gets fired through a smoothbore gun, it isn't very accurate and tends to wobble during flight. This wasn't a problem with the L7 gun, as it was a rifled barrel. And because most NATO tanks now use smoothbar guns, Hesh rounds aren't really used by NATO, with the exception of the British, which still use a rifled gun. Although most nations did abandon the high explosive squash head round, it proved very effective for the British Army in Iraq and Afghanistan during the wars. Our last weird shell of the video is a smoke shell. These rounds aren't really explosive, but they are chemical rounds. They consist largely of chemicals designed to create a smoke screen. This is usually white phosphorus, also known as Willy Peat. Because firing white phosphorus into civilian areas is kind of questionable, white phosphorus being pretty much impossible to put out once it's lit, it actually, the mere presence of it causes it to catch on fire. You can't put it out with water. So firing that into a building with civilians possibly inside is pretty much illegal for most armies. Unless you're the Russians, but oh well. Most tanks no longer carry smoke shells, instead they have smoke designators or smoke grenade launchers. You've probably seen these before when tanks fire smoke grenades up into the air and then disappear. It isn't really practical to fire a smoke shell at an enemy, seeing as most modern guns use laser rangefinders which would pretty much give away your position without firing. The main purpose of smoke shells though was to obscure you from your enemy. You'd fire it towards an enemy which would create smoke near them and stop them from being able to see around them basically. On the modern day battlefield, smoke shells are pretty much usually dropped from aircraft in the form of white phosphorus bombs or used by artillery to create a smoke screen, usually to allow troops or civilians to withdraw from fire. But I don't think any NATO tanks actually carry smoke shells anymore. We then come on to the high explosive anti-tank rounds. These use a shaped charge, which creates a jet of very hot metal, usually molten copper, which punches its way through an enemy's armour. This type of round was first used in 1940s by infantry assaulting a German castle. It was then later developed by the Germans into the first high explosive anti-tank tank round. As I said, all the power of this type of ammunition comes from the chemical energy stored within the shell. This means it penetrates the same amount of armour at 1000 metres as it does at 10 metres. Like I said in the last video, this meant you could stop building the massive guns that we saw at the end of World War II, such as the German 128mm gun found on the Jagdtiger. Instead, you could build modest guns with rather medium velocity cannons. In fact, the one caveat with high explosive anti-tank rounds is that their power is directly linked to the diameter of the shell. This means that a 90mm gun will always penetrate more than a 76mm gun. Whereas the power of a kinetic energy round is based on the calculation of velocity, weight, and shape of the projectile, the penetrative power of a high explosive anti-tank round is only linked to the diameter of that round. This is due to the shape charge and how they work, but it somewhat explains what we saw after the end of World War II. With the muzzle diameter of guns increased, they generally had quite low calibers. Because with armour piercing ammunition, you needed a large gun with a long barrel to get as high muzzle velocity as possible. With a high explosive anti-tank round, you could get the same penetrative power from a larger, albeit slower moving shell. These heat rounds would go on to make up most of the anti-tank weapons found in the immediate Cold War. From the rounds fired by tanks to stuff like RPGs, they all use shaped charges or high explosive anti-tank warheads. This naturally led to an evolution and that came in the form of the high explosive anti-tank fin stabilised. Just like in the last video, the APDS transformed into the APFSDS round, so did the high explosive anti-tank round. Heat FS was simply a heat warhead with fins attached to the rear of the shell, which improved flight performance. Testing was also done that found that shaped charge perform a lot worse when the round was spinning. This is what the addition of fins was mainly used for, to keep the round stable during flight and to limit the spinning. Before the mass adoption of armor piercing fin stabilized discarding Sabo later on in the Cold War, high explosive anti-tank fin stabilized was the best choice for a both accurate and long-range anti-tank round. But as I said earlier, in the early 1980s, 
The development of composite armour began. This used armour layered with ceramic blocks. This absorbed a lot of the energy produced in a ship charge detonation, effectively making the front 60 degrees of a main battle tank immune to heights building anti-tank warheads. This is what drove the adoption to armour piercing thin stabilised discarding Sabo, as heat FS rounds could no longer reliably penetrate the front of main battle tanks. There was also another invention that reduced the usefulness of the heat FS round. This was ERA, or Explosive Reactive Armour. Essentially, this was two metal plates with high explosives sandwiched in between. When a heat FS round hit an ERA block, the detonation of the heat FS round would cause the high explosive in the ERA block to also detonate, which would then somewhat nullify the penetrative power of the heat FS round. These ERA blocks, as well as the composite armour, proved to be the tank killing death of the heat FS round. Heat FS rounds didn't go away though, and most modern armies still use them, mainly for lightly armoured targets. But they aren't really called high explosive anti tank anymore, usually called MPAT, or multi purpose anti tank. They can be used as a traditional high explosive anti tank round, or as the name suggests, multi purpose, just detonate as a common high explosive round. Pretty much a do everything type of shell. Apart from APFSDS, this is the other main round carried by tanks such as the M1 Abrams and the Leopard 2. But, like most things in life, the Americans went one step further and developed the high explosive anti tank thin stabilised proximity fused round, or Heat FS VT. If you remember back to the high explosive variable time shell which we spoke about at the beginning of this video, you'll know that it was mainly used against enemy aeroplanes, first using the Pacific Theatre, while Heat FS VT was mainly used against helicopters, and was basically a variation of the MPAT round. This basically gave a fuse setting for a variable timed or proximity fuse. You would aim it at a flying helicopter, and if the round passed close to it and detected its radar signature, it would detonate, hopefully causing fatal damage to the helicopter. This was an addition to the MPAT round however, it wasn't a standalone round. The Americans called this the MH-30A1, and it could be effectively used against enemy armour, enemy infantry, and low flying enemy aircraft. As far as I'm aware, the M1A2 Abrams is the only tank to have this type of ammunition, although it could be fired by any of the tanks using a 120mm NATO approved gun. And finally, we have the high explosive anti tank grenade. This is basically a high explosive anti tank fin stabilised, but fired by incredibly low velocity weapons. For example, the RPG 7 rocket launcher or the 73mm gun found on the BMP 1 series of light tanks. These pretty much use propellant rather than a standard charge, giving them a very low velocity. These are mainly used on vehicles with a light frame, shall we say. If you stuck a large gun on a BMP, it'd probably rip the turret straight off when you fired it. So a low velocity gun, such as the 73mm one it was fitted with, is still incredibly powerful. Even though the round is moving very slowly, because it's a high explosive anti-tank warhead, it doesn't matter because it's a chemical round. It basically allowed infantry support vehicles with low velocity but high caliber guns to be very effective, like the Soviet BMP-1 or the French AML-90. Both very lightly built vehicles, but with substantial anti-tank capabilities. Alright, our final set of ammunition, anti-tank guided missiles. While most NATO countries do not operate these, at least from tanks, they are widely carried by Soviet vehicles. Most of the anti-tank guided missiles during the Cold War were aimed in two ways, either manually, with manual command line of sight, or semi-automatically, or semi-automatic command line of sight. MCLOS, or the manual version, was basically a man using a joystick to guide the missile. You would either have to use a tracer in the rear of the missile, or a small TV camera in the missile head. These were notoriously hard to aim, and were pretty ineffective in practice. The second type of ATGM, or SACLOS, would go on to become the main guidance system for most anti-tank guided missiles. Semi-automatic command line of sight is basically how we imagine anti-tank guided missiles are used and how we see them on TV. The operator aims at a target and then the missile guides itself onto what we are aiming at. Basically, the user puts a crosshairs on what he wants to hit and the missile aims for that crosshair. An example of this type of guidance is the tow missile used by the Americans. Pretty much all anti-tank guided missiles used a form of shape charge, or high explosive anti-tank warhead. The concept of an anti-tank guided missile is that they sacrifice high velocity for long range precision. Regular tank ammunition is pretty much uncontrollable after you've fired it, but with an anti-tank guided missile, you can theoretically guide it right in until impact, 
There are quite a lot of downsides with anti-tank guided missiles though. While they do pack a huge punch, usually knocking a tank out in a single hit. They require specialised equipment and tend to be cumbersome, resulting in a low rate of fire, as well as most vehicles only being able to carry a few rounds each, compared to the 40 or so regular types of tank ammunition. For example, the M3 Bradley carries 8 tow missiles, compared to the M1 Abrams, which carries nearly 40 rounds of tank rounds. AT gems are also incredibly expensive, at least compared to traditional tank weapons. As I said, most anti-tank guided missiles use a high explosive anti-tank warhead or a shape charge, so you don't really have to go into too much about how they actually work in terms of killing, and we've already really covered the guidance. We then also had the anti-tank guided missile tandem charge, also just known as a tandem charge warhead. This had a much smaller shape charge on the nose of the warhead. This would detonate any explosive reactive armor it encountered, allowing the larger main warhead behind it to actually penetrate the tank armor and hopefully knock out the tank. These tandem charge warheads were mainly used by western countries in an attempt to deal with the explosive reactive armor that was plastered on pretty much all of Soviet's main battle tanks. While this type of anti-tank guided missile was very effective against ERA blocks, again, the advancement of composite armor made these types of anti-tank missiles pretty irrelevant, as the tandem charge concept doesn't work against composite armor. We then also have a few variations of the anti-tank guided missile. We have an anti-tank guided missile with a proximity fuse warhead on it, which is it even still an anti-tank guided missile at that rate, or is it just an anti-aircraft missile? These were mainly carried by Soviet tank destroyers, really. The vehicles such as the Sturm S were mainly designed to take out enemy tanks, but they had anti-tank guided missile proximity fuse warheads developed just so they could take out helicopters or low-flying planes if they encountered them. Like the American M830A1 and the High Explosive Variable Time Fuse, they basically just use a proxy fuse warhead. On our last missile for the day, the anti-tank guided missile High Explosive. This is basically just like a ground-to-ground -ground Predator missile type thing. Instead of using a High Explosive Anti-Tank Shape Charge warhead, it purely just uses a High Explosive Charge. So we've gone full circle in this video, we started with a high explosive shell from the 1850s and we're ending with a high explosive missile from the 1980s. Again, this missile was just a Soviet thing really. Why spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a high explosive armed anti-tank guided missile when you could just use a high explosive anti-tank shell or a HE shell from a tank gun? These fell out of favour very quickly and to my knowledge no modern armies actually used just high explosive anti-tank guided missiles. They either used laser guided bombs dropped by aircraft or just HE rounds from tanks. So boys there you have it. All the chemical rounds used in modern armies to my knowledge at least. I'm by no means an expert. I'm just a military fan and a wannabe historian. But if you made any mistakes, leave a comment down below. If you liked the video, leave it an up like. If you didn't like it, leave it a down like, even though you can't see it anymore. Thank you very much for watching the video, lads. I hope you subscribe, and I'll see you in another video.